Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and hopefully my slides will come up in a sec. Great. Uh, and it's a little bit uh, coming full circle. I was a member of the Board on Children, Youth, and Families from 2000 to 2006 when we were creating a strategic plan and looking at what was emerging as important children's health issues. And at that time, the obesity epidemic was going full force. And we started to look at behavioral, mental health, and developmental problems and put them as a high priority. And I was talking to Bill Beardsley when I walked in. He came on the board right after I left. And they spent five or six years actually really elevating those issues. And, and I think this forum is, uh, is a result of uh, that, that effort. I'm going to be talking about optimizing behavioral health in children. And let me tell you the argument I'm going to make. One is that there's a growing prevalence and impact of these be, uh, mental, behavioral, and developmental disorders in children and youth. And it's a big, complex problem. Uh, this epidemic, and at its most fundamental, has similar causes to the obesity epidemic. Uh, and it, that's not how we always think about it, but it has to do with a mismatch between the evolutionary determined capacity of children or humans to develop and adapt and our man-made environment that we're forcing children to adapt to. There's a big mismatch that's going on in terms of development. Much can be done to better screen, diagnose, and treat me mental, behavioral, and developmental disorders by uh, in, in terms of addressing the changing nature of marginal risks. Uh, that w in very high-risk populations. But fundamentally, to address this cause, we, uh, to address the causes of causes, we need to move upstream and change the median risk for children rather than just at the margins. And that's a fundamentally different way of sort of thinking about this. The bad news is that our healthcare system is not well positioned to do uh, this, either historically, since we in our health insurance, all we covered was from the neck down for many, many years so that we haven't had good coverage from the neck up for the entals, mental, developmental, and dental, actually. So we're now covering that, but we're woefully inadequate in terms of our resources. Uh, there are a whole set of fixed and incremental strategies focused on marginal risk that would be quite helpful, and those are really important to pursue new screening methods and the, and the like. But what we really need to be thinking about and using the ACA is that it has a whole variety of tools that can be used if put together to actually move towards more transformative changes. And what I'm going to argue is that we need to take advantage and uh, really achieve a synergies in the ACA and everything that's coming across uh, to move forward, and that we really need a transformative analysis and approach to making this change. And I, I base this on this sort of notion that we have four different kinds of change strategies. We can fix things that are broken to, uh, and patch things in our system, and we have lots of broken parts of our health and healthcare system. We can make incremental improvements using evidence-based services and care, and most of our healthcare system is moving towards most of our, our, our changes are pretty incremental in what we're doing. And I put McV on here, which I actually, I think McV could actually be transformative, but when it's only funded to reach, you know, 2% of children, it ain't going to, you know, sort of do that. Uh, but we really need to think about what are the jolts and the, uh, the kinds of nudges that really are going to move the healthcare system forward. What are 3.0, and I'm going to talk about this, ACOs or health development organization, like what's developing in Cincinnati Children's or in, in Columbus, the kind of work that Kelly Kelleher is doing. What are those kinds of, uh, how do we sort of move things like that forward? How do we make McV actually a real, uh, real transitional program? How do we use PEDSnet, C3N, text? There's a whole set of really innovative stuff that's out there, but it has to be brought to scale. And how do we think about really moving toward transformation? So I'm going to encourage us to move from fix us strategies and incremental things to really thinking about transformative kinds of approaches. Now, we know that ACA is stimulating lots of turbulent disruptions. It's creating potential for substantial system innovation. There's a rush to develop ACOs, and, it's, uh, and there's growing pressure for different kinds of payment reforms. The ACA has many positives for kids in terms of expansion of parent health insurance. No lifetime caps, no discrimination based on pre-existing condition, and better access to preventive care. Those are all really positive. There are also things that are negatives in the ACA. There's a breakdown and regionalization of care that's happening all over the country as the market takes over, because basically what the ACA is is turning the healthcare marketplace over 
or healthcare over to the marketplace, and it's a corporatization of healthcare. That's what that's what ACOs are all about. There's a squeeze on children's health services in many of the community health centers. As community health centers gear up to take care of more of the Medicare, Medicaid dual eligibles. There's challenges for children's hospitals. Children's benefit packages are really inadequate around the country in terms of what exists in the exchanges. There are a whole lot of second and third order consequences. There's also lots of disincentives in terms of uh, focusing on kids because they're a small proportion of the overall expenditures. What Paul Weiss likes to say, we're just budget dust in terms of what really is being spent on health care, and so it doesn't demand the attention of anybody. The investments are only show potential benefits over a long time horizon, so we have this time problem that we can't get away from. Most of the challenges that we have to face in dealing with mental behavioral and developmental issues call for cross-sector kinds of approaches, and there's real challenges in terms of funding cross-sector issues. We have competitive health markets that are, high, are very narrowly focused on short-term, high-cost patients. And we have very simple business and payment models that are not aligned with producing value for kids, families, or our society. So there's a value equation that needs to be redefined in terms of what we're doing for kids. If, in fact, we're going to move forward, we have to recognize that we have an epidemic that's going on that we have 22% of adolescents that have mental health problems with impairment. And this is a very long and growing tail in terms of the distribution. 75% of the cumulative prevalence of mental health problems have their onset before age 25. And so this has to do with there's a huge life course front-loaded attributable risk to society in terms of what's going on. Part of why the U.S. is the sickest of rich nations has to do with these kinds of issues, and we need to bring that forward. But we have the most inefficient, low-value, low-ROI health system in the developed world, so that's not good news. So how do we take that health system and make it perform better? And what I'm going to argue, we need to change the operating system. We can't just keep adding more and more new apps at, for 1% of the population and think that it's going to make the kind of changes. And we have a big issue here. So we have three other kinds of challenges. One is an analytic challenge. We need really a life course health focused development model to really understand this problem. And we need a paradigm shift in understanding the context of brain development and the growing mismatch between how our brains are developing and the, and the kind of society that we're creating for our children to develop in. Second is we have to deal with the scope and scale problem. You know, this is a big complex issue, and so we're going to have to use complex adaptive systems kinds of approaches to this. We need system scientists, implementation scientists. It's not going to be solved by a bunch of pediatricians and child psychiatrists and psychologists. This is a big systems kind of issue that we need to take on in that way. And we have an audacity deficit. This requires a major national effort and a new narrative, leadership, and measures and approach, and we need to sort of elevate it to the level that it really needs to be at. So the problem are staring us right in the face, and we're not recognizing it for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, and the causes have become very normative in our landscape, so we don't see them as, as readily. And it requires the big levers to change these things. So it's not going to be little things only that I can do as a pediatrician or a child psychiatrist can do. It's the big levers that actually have to do with how our children are growing and developing. We haven't had a big genetic change in the last 20, 30 years. You know, there's other things happen. And here is part of the evidence. When we look at what is going on in terms of medical conditions in adults, what we see is that mental health conditions have increased dramatically, actually threefold over this time period. So we know there's lots of mental health conditions in the pipeline and they're moving forward. When we look at the children's health, when we looked at the IOM report on the sickest nation, what we saw also in that report is it made two points. One was that the United States spends as much money on health and welfare and social services as all the other nations. But we spend all our money at the end of the lifespan for sickness care. They're spending all of their money at the beginning of the lifespan for health and education and support. So we have a big mismatch of where we're spending money lifespan-wise, and that is really an important issue. And the second issue was when you looked at the ranking of the countries, basically in childhood we were way behind. And this comes from the UNICEF report. What you see is the United States is at the bottom of the barrel 
for both health and mental health issues, we sit at the bottom. So our kids start off way behind all the rest of the country. So there's no wonder that we have more people with chronic illness, you know, uh, and that these mental and behavioral issues are really important. Now, we know that there's been a dramatic change in morbidity and mortality for children, but what we're seeing, and mortality is going down, and that's great, but what we're seeing increased morbidity and increased chronic health problems, and it's not increased numbers of kids with hemophilia, cancer, and congenital heart disease. Well, we're seeing growing prevalence of mental health problems, growing problems in developmental disabilities and developmental issues, and growing numbers of kids with comorbidities. And there's a reason why ADHD, obesity, and asthma and these things are all increasing. There are environmental changes that are happening, and some of them are the same environmental changes. The toxic stress actually increases obesity, it increases asthma, and increases mental health problems. And we have parents living in very unstable environments. This is from work that I've been doing for the last 30 years with Paul Nuacek and others looking at the trend in disability in the country. And what you see here is 1960 from the Health Interview Survey. We had 2% of children disabled by 2008. We're up close to 8%, and those keep continuing to go on. When we did an analysis of the data from 2000 to 2010, there was a 16% increase in the number of children with disability. When we look at the poster child for disability in 1960, it's a little girl with braces and crutches who had polio. When we look at the poster child for disability now, it's a, it's a boy with autism, okay? And it's a complete change in terms of what's going on. This is staring us right in the face. It's been staring at us for years, yet we're not doing much to change this. This is looking at mental health disorders across the lifespan, and I just point out what the rapid increase in mental health disorders are all taking place during childhood and adolescence. And so what we know is that we have 4 to 6 percent of kids with severe disability, 14 to 18 percent of kids with special health care needs, as defined by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, but we have 30 to 40 percent of children with mental behavioral learning problems or are at risk for these so that they need more than average number of services. We have 50 to 60 percent of kids who are good enough, and I won't talk about the good enough right now because good enough is actually probably not one of the categories we want to have. We actually want to know what percent of our children are thriving. So what we know is that adversity is really important in terms of the loss of human health potential. So what, part of what we're talking about is this rapid loss of health developmental potential that happens early in life. And adversity and prosperity dramatically affect these things. Adversity comes in many forms. We just did a report in the health affairs in December about ACEs in the population, and 44.8% of children 0 to 17 have ACEs, 22% have two or more adverse childhood experiences, and we also just did a report on the, on the social gradient, and there's a huge, steep social gradient, and I'm going to come back to that. We have over 40 percent of our children live in low-income families that we know from our research says that those kids won't thrive. We know that they're not going to thrive, that, and it's, so it's not a marginal group of kids. We're talking about close to the median in terms of what's going on, so we have to really shift our focus and that we have rising rates of these issues. And what we know, and again from the mismatch, is that we have insufficient resources for families in terms of child rearing. Their parents don't have enough time, income, and services available to them. We have increased family instability in the United States with long-term uncertainty, so families are less stable, secure, and supported. And we have deep uncertainty in terms of the future. Adolescents are growing up in these environments in which they don't know what the future is going to hold, whether it's global warming or ISIS or all these things, you know, that are happening and it makes an enormous amount of future anxiety. We have greater inequality in the country, and so we have a steep social gradient with the status drop at every level, and the ability to go to the next level is becoming harder and harder. And it's very frustrating and debilitating. We have decreased supportive scaffolding to compensate for and buffer and uncouple the ACEs. And we have massive cultural changes that are going on right in front of our eyes that are having enormous impact on our kids in ways. And when you add all this together, you have this enormous mismatch between what we were evolutionarily designed for and the kinds of support that we're providing. So 
and we have a health system that's not performing very well and have enormous constraints and low quality and various other things. So we have this trajectory that we're trying to achieve and we have this current practice, we have this enormous opportunity gap. And we have to make this clear to Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush, who are both talking about the opportunity gap because it's an economic opportunity gap. We have a human capital opportunity gap, a human potential opportunity gap. And this needs to be pushed onto the political agenda for the next uh, election so that we get the candidates talking about this. Now, I want to just point out that we also using the wrong models to think about it. You know, we have this biomedical model that developed a hundred or so years ago, which is simple, mechanistic, and linear. That was transformed by Framingham and behavioral uh, medicine, basically, so that we learned that disease wasn't just bad genes and bad luck, but it had to do with social environments and behaviors and various other things. And that led to the biopsychosocial model that most of us buy into. Uh, and that's a hierarchical dynamic systems model looking at multiple determinants of health. But over the last 20 years, we've had a revolution in our life course health sciences with epigenetics and developmental origins of health and disease and neurodevelopmental research. And we're moving towards a wholly different model of thinking about how health develops. Yet we're continuing to go back, just like with obesity, we go back to biomedical sort of explanations that obesity is all about calories in, calories out. It's, yeah, that's true. That's a final common pathway, but that's not what's causing the problem. Same thing, we can talk about neurotransmitter issues and serotonin uptake and uh, various kinds of things that are going to happen in, in the brain. Those are final common pathways. We can interfere with that, but the issues are much further upstream in terms of what we need to deal with. And so we need to be moving towards life course and, and having our science drive this in ways that allow us to make a different kind of case than we have. And so the life course health development models are starting to allow us to think more about how uh, multiple different contexts affect children's development and understand the time-specific and time-dependent, the cumulative and the programming effects or embedding effects that lead to variable kinds of behavioral, biological, and developmental adaptations, and how that leads to these different developmental trajectories. So there's a whole science of this that's emerging over the last several years. It started to be previewed in the Children's Health Nation's Wealth Report that the IOM put out in 2004, but this is a new and different kind of model. We need to be pushing this forward as well in our science. And we know a lot more about how time-sensitive pathways influence the development of the midbrain, how toxic stress influences the midbrain in terms of attachment, and prefrontal cortex in terms of executive function, the HPA axis, how this leads to health and behavioral problems, and more importantly, how it leads to chronic disease. The people that have disabilities with mental and behavioral issues in their 20s, 30s, and 40s are the people that are going to have heart disease, diabetes, chronic disease in their 50s and 60s. It, it's, that's the pathway. And what we also understand are these conditions start early and the differentials start early, early in life, so that we see this is the famous Hart Ridgely study and the 30 million word gap. You know, but what's important here is brain development is changing very early in the lifespan, okay? And disparities are being impacted and embedded into the biology early on. And it's not just a 30 million word gap, it's a 30 million hug gap, it's a 30 million lots of things gap that's going on for these children. And what we know from recent studies is that this is not just functionally what's happening, but we know that the total gray matter difference, so these trajectories are different in terms of the biological function also. So we have this basic model that exists in terms of what are the risk factors pushing down on trajectories and what are the protective factors. And the reason we use this model and why I think it's so important is that from a public policy standpoint, it says, how do we increase the number of protective factors, reduce the risk factors to optimize these trajectories? And people in health, education, family support, police officers, they all understand this. And we have to ha start having common frameworks and common models about human capital development that actually drives this. And we have to make this sort of brain drain that's happening in the first five years of life be unacceptable in the country because it's about what's happening early on that's important. I just show this briefly because we're not the only ones thinking about it. This is from the UK. It's a life course model about mental capacity that they're 
National Academy of Science equivalent uh, uh, came up with, so that there's lots of work going on these, uh, in terms of these models. I want to, I'm known to be a person, I, I'm out of time, but I got a little bit more to say here. Because uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten to the punchline yet. I'm, I'm, I'm known to be more of an early childhood person, and I told somebody, and I'm, I'm with about my colleague, Mary Jane Rothram, who is really the adolescent expert. I want to uh, talk about adolescence a bit, because what's important is all these, all these conditions are having their onset during adolescence. And, so, and we're not paying much attention to it, but what we're not paying attention to is what's going on in terms of adolescence. We have this, this major mismatch that's happening. We have our paleolithic brains with this postmodern information age. So we have this accelerated biological development that's happening in terms of acceleration of puberty early on and you know, uh, starting four, three to four years earlier because of better nutrition and other issues. We have accelerated and unstable social development for children. We have unprotected and unsupported development for many adolescents. It's segregated development that adolescents are no longer being supported in their development by their parents and family as much as they're being developing themselves on the side through their own cultural form. We have colonized development because what's happening is the technology and marketplace are going into this period that used to be four to five years long and is now 15 years long. It's not surrounded anymore by religion and family and other things. And it's sort of this period of the life course that's been sort of flayed open and the markets and technology are taking over. It's extended, so we start too soon and it ends too late. And so that we have this enormous mismatch that's going on. The other issue is that we have mental health services for these kids, but they're not getting the kids, or getting the services. So we've laid out, and I think for some of the board members, and this, I think they provided this article with this a 3.0 transformation framework. How do we start thinking about this in a different way? It's based on a kind of simple model that basically our first era of health care was about focus on acute care and infectious disease. It was focused on the biomedical model. It's the epidemiologic shift that took place in the night from 1900 to 1950, and people started to live in their 60s and 70s, we've switched to a chronic disease model, longer time frames, use the biopsychosocial model to uh, think about things. We changed the way that our whole healthcare system's paid for, moved towards this corporate model of providing healthcare, but where we're headed is increasingly focused on optimizing health, and that that will be using this life course model. And so that what we've done is we've gone from a 1.0 system to 2.0, we're heading to 3.0. And so our American health system is about 1.5, and what we need to figure out is how do we get it to 3.0. Most of the European systems are about 2.2 or 2.4 because they're really focused on, on optimization. And what the ACA was about was about creating ACOs, which are about creating Kaisers. Basically, it's the Kaiserfication of the healthcare system. And so we're really trying to, you know, and I had a, conversation, Ellen Marie remembers probably that with the former head of CMMI, when I talked to him about we need to go to 3.0, he said, I'm only going to 2.0, basically. <laughs> uh, he says, I just want to get these ACOs up. And, but I think we have to have a broader vision and be thinking a little more broadly about it. And there's models that exist for what a 1.0 or 2.0 or 3.0 system. This was actually created by CMS. And it's, again, in the article that I provided in terms of what a community-integrated children's health system would look like. And we need to think about what the logic for a 3.0 system is, how we think about the development of health, how we optimize health. And so there's a different logic model that we use if we're going to move in this direction. We have to think about how we move from these siloed systems that we currently have where mental health, early intervention, school health is funded differently. It's outside the system. It's outside what we do. So how do we move towards systems that are integrated and we redesign the system in a way that makes sense? So what's the redesign look like? How do we start building the scaffolding around higher trajectories? What's the horizontal and vertical integration strategies? What I'm showing here is a redesign 
around a higher trajectory where you're using the nurse family partnership and early head start and pediatric medical home and triple P parenting programs, you're building the scaffolding over a higher trajectory. And what are the building codes that we need for that kind of scaffolding? Because if we don't provide it, there's too many kids living in neighborhoods where earthquakes are rolling through their lives on a daily basis and the scaffolding isn't there to support it and they fall down. And that's happening over and over again. Yet we know what the scaffolding should be. We know what the building codes are, and we're not doing it. How do we change the way the pediatric office works? You know, if, in fact, we want to provide better developmental service, the pediatric office has to be connected to all this stuff, and it isn't. So how do we redesign pediatrics to do that? How do we in redo the pediatric 18-month visit? Right now, we're screening kids for the 4 to 6 percent of kids with disabilities and sending them to the regional center. Yet, we should be screening for 30 to 40 percent of children that have problems. The reason we can't do it is there's no place to send them. So we can come up with the best screening protocols in the world, but if there's no place to send them and we can't send them anywhere, no one's going to do it. So we need to be thinking about how do we go from a current system where we're screening and sending them to some kind of regional center. And this is not working, guys. You know, in most states, 1 to 2 percent of kids are making it into the IDA system. In North Carolina and Vermont, it's about 6 to 8 percent. California, it's 1 to 2 percent. Texas, 1 to 2 percent. Kids aren't being screened. They're not making it into the system. And we need to re-engineer this so we can figure out how do we use family daycare centers and Head Starts and various other places to do surveillance connect the pediatric medical home to a whole different kind of system. So what's the re-engineering strategy? You know, what's the innovation that's going to allow us to create a different kind of pathway than we have currently? So this is a big system innovation. How do we measure things differently if we're interested in, school in measuring trajectories? How do we set up health development measurement systems? How do we start connecting things up? We can, we're doing, it's all about big data, but how do we link birth certificate and school readiness? And we're doing this around the country now. You know, we're measuring school readiness in neighborhoods in the country, and this is a part of Los Angeles where we're measuring neighborhood by neighborhood. The dark green is the number of kids that have vulnerability in their social competence, neighborhood by neighborhood, and the pink is the number percentage of mothers who are depressed. So we're bringing data down to a neighborhood level and saying, this is how your kids are doing at a neighborhood level. This is the level of maternal depression. Let's work with the big levers and figure out how we change things. And we're creating ways for communities to use the same kind of dashboards that Uma Kadagal is using at Cincinnati Children's to drive change in the hospital. We're doing the same thing in communities where we're measuring how well the community is making changes on screening for maternal depression or early childhood development. And we're looking at these trajectories and the risk and protective factors and using dashboards. So there's all kinds of ways that we can be moving this forward. Just to close, and I know you want me to close, uh, we need to really commit ourselves to a 2025 vision of transforming our children's health system. We need to adopt this 3.0 strategic framework of change. We need to make this catastrophic, unnecessary loss of human potential be something that our politicians can't run away from, okay, and can't be talking about incremental changes anymore. And we need to really a child health development national network that's really trying to move this forward. In the December issue of Health Affairs, Paul Weiss and Chris Forrest and I wrote a paper on laying out a national agenda. What we suggested is that we need a national health development action plan that's bold, audacious, innovative. And what we suggested in this, just to be provocative, that this should elevate the Maternal and Child Health Bureau from the bowels of the federal government and HRSA up to a more prominent position and link it with the Federal Reserve to move this forward. Because we need to sort of understand that this is about our future human capital development. We need to get not just 10 communities, but 1,000 communities over the next 10 years to basically transform their children's health system and to make those kinds of innovations move forward and to use CMMI dollars and, state, and create a state kids state innovation model. We need to be 
taking those billions of dollars that are at CMMI and using them for kids and not just for the frail elderly. And we need to be starting on this and moving this kind of an agenda forward. We need to transform pediatric health care. Uh, and what I'm showing here is, you know, we need to have these, the vision, we need to have these new operating systems. We have to create really new apps for pediatric care. We need to move away from our 1950s operating system and really change what we're doing in pediatrics and com create community accountable health development systems for children. We need to create an early life course infrastructure like what they're doing in Magnolia Community Initiative in LA, what Rob Kahn is doing in Cincinnati and various other places where you're creating whole new platforms to promote early childhood development. We called for a different research agenda and a different kinds of measurement and sensing system. And Peter Margolis and Chris Forrest who are creating PEDSnet and the Rhode Island KidsNet, we need to be mating our population health systems and our clinical systems so that we have the data systems to give us real time. We're very close to doing this, but we, we really need to be pushing this forward at warp speed, not over the next 10 or 15 years, but over the next couple of years. So to finish, the ACA uh, could be used to transform children's health care and to really rapidly change things. We've begun to work on something called the Child Health System Transformation Initiative, and we have funding from the uh, Kresge Foundation, and hopefully we're gonna get, now going to get funding from our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to figure out how do we start to work within the sectors of children's health to improve and innovate, to create the kind of measurement systems, to analyze the data, so that we start doing and scaling solutions in all these sectors so that we actually are making change and trying to do whole system change. So this is just a diagram to say if we're going to transform our system, we have a kind of a, a way of thinking about data that needs to be measured, how we improve what children's hospitals are doing, community health centers, school health centers, how do we prototype this, come to scalable models and actually implement it in communities. And how do we create a national strategy to do this? And the Moving Healthcare Upstream that's being funded by Kresge is working right now with community health systems and children's hospitals and trying to move this forward. And basically, there are frameworks for doing this. This is showing how we would move forward in communities in order to move this kind of initiative forward. What's What's the different financing? How do we take collaborative action? What's the system innovation? So let me stop there. What I've tried to do is be provocative and suggest that we need to think differently analytically about this issue, that we have this enormous mismatch. We need to be thinking not just about incremental solutions, but how we change the operating system and really take this, this problem on at the, at the complexity and scale that it needs to be taken on and think about how we bring together the different sectors in order to do that to move it forward. Thank you very much. You know, for those of you who think that I'm full of it, I want to hear it too. You know, <laughs> or I'm being too ambitious, or you know, or we couldn't do this in our schools in the, in the country. We know there's no way for us to do it, to move schools to 3.0. You know, or we can't make our pediatric clinics do that, or what it will take. Yeah. So I'm Ron Manderscheid. I'm from the County Behavioral Health Directors. Uh, we I love your vision. To get it to go anywhere, you have to get it embedded into federal policy. So let me propose a couple of things. The work on Healthy People 2030 is just beginning now. There's no reason that what you're proposing couldn't be the framework for Healthy People 2030. Uh, I know HHS is beginning to ramp up the uh, external ad secretarial advisory group for Healthy People 2030. You could have a theme. 
and healthy people 2030 on uh, healthy development of children, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what I'm arguing is it's fine to have the vision, but if you don't link it to external things that are ongoing, it won't go anywhere here, basically. I think the, is this on? Okay. I think that's a very uh, good suggestion. I was actually on the Secretary's Committee for Healthy People 20. 10 or the IOM committee for selecting the leading indicators and we tried to push the life course healthy development at that point secretaries for 2020 put life course in yes my I think that we need to move in that direction yeah. and and do that my concern is is that because children are small amounts of the budget and small amounts of the cost we sort of get, end up getting uh, marginalized. And the, the question is going to be, if it's going to be part of Healthy People 2030 and that health development is going to come forward and the life course issues are going to come forward and what's at stake, we really have to figure out how we move that forward in a very different way. And hopefully Jeff Levy, when he talks later today and is talking about uh, issues that have to right. do with okay. public health, that maybe he could address that as well. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Neil, thanks for being here and presenting and presenting your vision for the future. I was going along with you the whole time until your third to last slide, I think, in which you presented these systems, but they were independent streams. So I was struck by the issue that our problem is, is that the school system and the health system are not communicating with each other around the whole child. So optimizing each of those streams, it feels to me, was was contradictory to what you were describing for the majority of your presentation. Right. So that's a great question, Uma, and uh, this is a new microphone, so maybe that's better. So what that la third of the last slide was showing that we need to begin with people where they're at. So you have children's hospitals need to be thinking differently about their game plan. School-based health centers, the school-linked health centers have to be thinking about how do they organize themselves, how do they move from being kind of the flea on the fly and the horse's tail outside of the health system to being integral and move forward, same with mental health. But the idea is as those, each of those sectors is working on their own innovations and scalable models, we start working with communities like Cincinnati or Columbus or Oakland or Long Beach or, you know, Hartford and have them pull all this together. So we're going to work both within the silos and in innovation, but work across them in communities at the same time. So it's through the place-based initiatives and communities saying, like Milwaukee has said, we're going to have the healthiest children in the world over the next 10 years. What do we do to do that? And how do we bring that all together? So you have to link the sector le level or silo-based innovations and begin to move forward. And that's where the, the different financing structures and, and thinking differently about how do we get cross-sector financing. And it's going to be more than social impact bonds. Uh, you know, because impact bonds are just a performance contract. We need to be thinking about very different kinds of fiscal structures because part of what we need to be able to do is be able to package and sell risk, financial risk across sectors and over time. And, uh, and a social impact bond won't allow you to do that. There are other fiscal instruments that could be used to do that. And so that we need to be thinking about what those other fiscal strategies are. I spent a year a year ago at the Federal Reserve Bank as a visiting scholar, mm -hmm. so we started talking about what those kinds of fiscal instruments might look like with some of the people from the capital markets to talk about it. So we have to be thinking about all this at the same time. Neil, this I'm Dave Shern from uh, the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors and Mental Health America, and I, I just think you've done a terrific job of pulling an awful lot of information together and what's a very compelling argument. We've been arguing, you know, that really we're ready for the next era of public health and that behavioral health conditions and human development is going to be the centerpiece of that as opposed to sort of a segregated set of issues handled by a different system. So uh, I, just, I just think it's compelling. One thing we've found kind of helpful in terms of describing this to people is, is trying to draw parallels with the development of the germ theory and how that revolutionized, how sort of public hygiene revolutionized the, the way of our, our health is maintained. And I was uh, intrigued by, and when you, so what we say is, you know, you think about, well, all we need to do is eliminate poverty, eliminate child abuse, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll solve these problems. Those just sound like such gargantuan tasks that people say, yeah, well, right after we, we take care of this world peace problem, we'll get to that. 
However, if you think about when the, the sanitarians were talking about building public health infrastructure and the task was to pipe clean water into every house and to pipe sewage out, that had to also feel gargantuanly difficult uh, to accomplish. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how we can incrementally talk about developing the structure. Ron talked about federal policy. I'm kind of intrigued with what's actually happening in communities, because uh, I think communities in the, in the the sanitarian movement, communities were actually instrumental in developing the public health systems. The federal role really came later. I'm just curious about your thoughts sure, about that. Sure. So if you look at any of the public health uh, issues of the, of the 20th century where there was success, there were four issues that had to do with why they were successful. One was that they, um, there was good scientific basis for, to rationalize what they were doing, so germ theory. At this point, it's the epigenetics of uh, biological embedding of what's going on in, in terms of how the social environment gets under the skin. So we have a whole new science, right? So it's science. The second thing is they had good measures, okay? And they were able to measure infant mortality and measure deaths and various things. We have to be able to have better measures of health development, not just measure and, and put together these trajectories in ways. And in fact, my colleagues in Canada are putting together health development measurement systems. So they're doing the same in Australia. We're way behind the curve on that. So you had good measures, good science, good measures. Third thing that they had was all of the, all the things that were successful cross race and class lines. So they can't be about other people's children or just for the poor, or else they become poor programs. And the fourth thing was that it, there was local accountability and local ways that you could do things. So that's the whole point of bringing the data down to the neighborhood level and giving people data that they can have on their smartphones and parents can talk about and move forward. So we know, at least from the last century, that those are four characteristics that were important in terms of moving things forward. So thinking in the same way, you know, how do we, how do we take the science, how do we take the measurement, how do we bring it to a local level, and how do we make this about all kids? And, the, and that's where the marginal risk versus the median risk got. If we're only dealing with the tail of the distribution of, in terms of screening the kids that just happen to be at the tail of the distribution and bringing them forward, we're not dealing with the issues that our whole distribution, is, we're creating this longer and longer tail that's going in that direction. So we need to think about where the leverage point is. When you have a social gradient that looks like this, huge, steep social gradient, Lifting the bottom of the social gradient isn't where the leverage point is. So you, you know, where you have to think about it, leverage is in the median of the, so that we need to be thinking about really different strategies that are about all kids, not just about poor kids. And because we could get rid of all the child abuse, you know, if we were really good at ferreting all, it's still not going to shift everything over and start to change the risk for the rest of the population. So this marginal versus median risk change is really important, and it's very different than the way that doctors and mental health people think about things. It's a, it's a more public health strategy, but it's a very different way of thinking. Uh, thank you. I'm Doug Tynan from the American Psychological Association, and thank you for a, a great presentation. Um, to, as one of the earlier uh, people up here asked about the different streams and different pathways. One of the difficulties I think I see with implementation of the Affordable Care Act is we still, as we have more care available, we still tend to segment health and mental health into different sectors. I noticed one of your slides shows the highest rates of increases were not only in adult depression but also in hyperlipidemia and, and uh, obesity. And I guess at some point we really have to educate not only the public but all health professionals and other professionals about causes the same things that cause uh, mental illness what's defined as mental illness are the same variables that cause illness I think it's that's a hard concept people like to think of depression as lowered serotonin levels and they like to think of obesity as too much food and not enough exercise but the reality is when you're, if you're treating adults with that or you're trying to prevent it in children, you're trying to do the same lifestyle changes by, by changes in the environment. So I think conceptually, we really have to get to back to, or we have to get to some simple effective messaging that gets these ideas across that the same, uh, that we should be interested in the variables on the left right. rather than the variables on the right. So one of the strategies in terms of doing that, you know, and the work that we're doing, the 
Tech's initiative, Transforming Early Childhood Community Systems, one of the things we say, it's about whole child, whole family, whole community, all right? And, and part of what we're using those maps and measures of how children are doing is not just to bring the, the health community and the early childhood community and the schools and the family support people, but how do you bring the police and the housing and other people to the table as well? You know, so it's about our whole city, our whole community. Now, that's happened to some extent around the obesity epidemic. People have realized that you have to change the way that we organize ourselves, change the lived environment, move forward. It's very similar to in, in this issue. So part of what we've begun starting to do uh, is we're taking our data on social emotional development of children neighborhood by neighborhood in the city of Hartford, for example, and matching that with the housing data about housing stress. And all of a sudden, the housing people and real estate people start to go, oh, early childhood is important to us. You map it with the, with the police data and show it to the police chief of Los Angeles, uh, sheriff of Los Angeles County, and he goes, oh, our uh, social emotional development of children and the arrests in those communities are, are linked. And how do I do upstream policing? you know, so that we can do that. So there's a whole focus on, you know, how do we move upstream to these social causes of causes, but also how do we move upstream developmentally to the earlier uh, aspects and things. And, and I agree with you, they're all very, same, very similar, and that's why I said the same mismatch that's leading to the obesity epidemic is leading to the, uh, to the kind of mental health issues that we're seeing, and we need to be thinking about them in, in that way and thinking about very different kinds of levers and innovations that we might do. Neil, as usual, it's a great presentation. And, um, but I find that as I age, I've gotten much more pessimistic than you have. And the two, um, the big thing that you said early on in your talk, was that basically, in order to implement a vision of this type, there's going to have to be a fundamental reallocation from the elderly to the young, which for me is going to involve politicians and private enterprise. So I want to hear about what are going to be these huge levers that we're going to be able to change to get this big reallocation from basically all of us in this room to the young kids that we're having. That's what I don't see happening. Yeah. So, I, and I agree, I agree with you that, that one can be very pessimistic about that. Gene Sterling at the Urban Institute just wrote a great book called Dead Men Ruling. And what Dead Men Ruling is about is how all of our uh, current policies and all of our budget allocation are basically were made by men who are now dead, long dead. So we have Medicare and Social Security, and basically we have no more money because they made all the rules and they're dead, and we have to live by it. And so, and, but, and we have this sort of massive sure. amount of capital that's flowing to the end of the lifespan. But, but the way, reason why I'm more optimistic is when I've sat down with some bankers <coughs> and people in the finance world, they understand that we have, you know, we've had all this money flowing to one end of the lifespan for a long time, and it's not sustainable anymore because what we're seeing, and they're thinking about, okay, how do we think about different kinds of investment strategies so that we change them? So I think if you have bankers thinking about different kinds of investment strategies, we have some possibility. I think that it's going to be an issue of uh, raising this on the political agenda. But I think another issue in what you're raising, what political scientists would say, is the governance burden. How do we change things? when there's a, such a huge governance burden, meaning that we have to change our government so fundamentally in a way. So what are the things that we can do to change things that don't require such a governance burden? And some of those things can happen in local communities. You know, you can have people in, you know, cities like Columbus and Cincinnati and, you know, Long Beach and other, come together and say, okay, we're going to change what we're doing. We understand how to do that. Now, that's going to be part of a movement a, uh, and, and a change that will have to be, you know, uh, uh, corralled over some period of time so that we also get the kind of policy changes over time. Uh, but I think that we can do it. I'm actually more optimistic than pessimistic, but I think we have to have the vision and the leadership that's going to do that, and I think we have to hold our, our politicians accountable. 
Um, I, I want to encourage, um, Jose would like to ask one more question. And um, if we could give the quickest question in the history Very of quick. the world and the quickest answer. Very quick. Uh, philanthropy, big philanthropists are um, signing the pledge to give away half their wealth. What if we, the older population, sign away the last six months of our life to give grab those funds to children? Well, that's similar to what Zeke Emanuel wrote about in the New York Times, you know, sort of the expiration clause, like at 75, you just, you know, you, you know, a after that. <laughs> He said after 75, he wasn't going to ask for anything more from the, you know, he was just going to have regular care. You know, there's some issues around, you know, the money flowing to the end of life. But it's not just in the last six months. You know, what we need to recognize is over the last century, what has happened is life expectancy went from 45 to 85. We've had to build an enormous scaffolding to support old age in this country. And it's not just old age at 80, it's old age at 70 and at 65. You know, 65 can't be the new 40 unless we put all the scaffolding under it. So what we've done is we've created this enormous developmental scaffolding at the end of life, and it's not just Medicare and Social Security. It's how our mortgages are structured. So we have 30-year mortgages that deliver people money at the end of their work life. It's how our pensions are structured. So we have all this public policy that sends all the money to the end of the lifespan, plus we've made all these investments in things that provide services at the end of the lifespan, whether they're white belts and white shoes for guys that play golf, you know, or cruises, all that is money flowing in one direction, okay? And so part of what we need to be thinking about is, you know, how do we figure out a way of sending money to the beginning of the lifespan again and actually make those investments? Your, your proposal is one. There's others that you could work in the pension system and actually create ways of cycling money that workers have now and using those to invest in trusts that are actually invested early on that have a return on those. So there are different ways for us to be thinking at it, but we have to stand back and sort of say, oh, there's all this flow of money just going in one direction. How do we change that flow in a way that people are going to allow that to happen and, and understand they might not get a 4% return, they might get a 2% return, but I'll be okay with a 2% return if it's, if, if it's helping my grandkids.